the real co-ed killer, before Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, before the term serial killer was even a term used by the public. Michigan's now infamous killer was making national news in a two-year period time. The collage boy who never fit anyone's image of a killer struck repeatedly at random. John Normal Collins launched his one-man assault against young women in the Washtenaw County in southeastern Michigan between 1967 and 1969. He known as the The Coed Killer, The Michigan Murders, The Ypsilanti Killer, and The Ypsilanti Ripper. John Norman Collins was born in Windsor, Canada on June 17, 1947 the son of Richard and Loretta Chapman. John was the youngest of three. He had an older brother Jerry and sister Gail. John's father Richard was a light infantry officer and an explosive-slash-demolition expert in His Majesty's Canadian Services, sadly he lost his left leg in 1944 during World War II. Living on medical the rest of his life, Loretta divorced him allegedly for extreme mental cruelty. Many sources said Richard was an abusive alcoholic. According to John Norman Collins, cousin John Philip Chapman Richard was never abusive towards Loretta or their children. Loretta would tell her kids untrue stories and then kids then didn't want to be bothered with their father. Hoping to avoid dragging their children through a bitter divorce, Richard gave Loretta what she wanted, full custody. Loretta struggled to raise her three children on her own, working various of jobs. Shortly after the divorce she remarried, whose name is unknown but that marriage only lasted a year. In 1951 Loretta left Canada with her three children for Centerline, Michigan, about 30 minutes north of Detroit and married for the third time to a William Collins who formally adopted all three children. William turned out to be a violent alcoholic and beat his family. John's stepfather once threw him across the car at his mother. On another occasion, William used John at the age of four as a shield when he was confronted by another man with a gun. At the age of five John was still wearing diapers to school and had a bedwetting problem. Loretta and William would leave John and his siblings in the car for hours while they were at the bar drinking. Loretta later divorced William in 1956. By the age of nine John had three father figures with a great deal of DV as his mother worked hard as a waitress she formed yet another relationship with a man. No more is known. John went to a Catholic school, St. Clement High. He was described as a polite and handsome man, very popular in high school. He was an honor student, tri-captain of the football team and president of the C-Club and was the star pitcher of the baseball team and was a part of the wrestling team. John had an obsession with motorcycles, side note, he kept all four running with stolen parts. In 1956 John enrolled in Central Michigan University and after a year, he enrolled at Eastern Michigan University to major in education to teach the upper elementary grades. College wasn't much different than high school, at first. Collins became the vice president of the ski club, played sports, and was in the Theta Chi fraternity. He was later expelled out of the fraternity on suspicion of stealing. His teacher said he was a quick, alert student but noted that his grades declined by the second half of his sophomore year. John should have graduated in 1969 but was 24 credits short and had made no attempt to make them up over the summer. During his sophomore year at Eastern Michigan University one professor accused him of cheating and he began committing petty thefts often just for thrills. That is where he met Andrew Manuel who later becomes a partner in some of escapades. Collins had a large sexual obsession, several girls reported how he could fly into range at the smallest thing. He even quoted the Sixth Commandment at one girl who danced too provocatively for him. He was Catholic although he made a few remarks that provided potential motives for some of the killings. One former girlfriend remembered a time when Collins had walked her across campus and then began to touch her. Suddenly, he held her away and angrily asked if she was having her period. She admitted she was and he yelled that is really disgusting, then stormed off. Another co-ed recalled riding with him near some wooded area and they stopped under a tree to rest and John asked her if she would be scared if he was the co-ed killer and that she could be the next victim. She thought he was kidding, but the serious expression on his face made her uneasy. Spring semester in 1969. Would drive down Giddy's Road which leads to most of the places where the bodies were discovered. One day she said to John, I just saw something, this is where they've been finding bodies, he said, yeah, I know. You want to go look for some? Rana never suspected him. Another girl who said she met a man who looked like Collins remembered him saying that he couldn't stand girls with pierced ears because they left holes that defile their bodies. 
he also told her that once he strangled a cat with a clothesline. And to make his point he put his hands on the girl's throat. Some women described him as a bondage freak this may be from an incident when he found Gail, his pregnant sister in bed with another man. Collins beat the man unconscious and then hit Gail calling her a tramp until she bled. Collins also had expressed some ideologies that bordered on psychopathy. Characteristics are, lack of guilt, remorse or empathy. Pretending to feel emotion and ability to form true emotional attachments. They tend to be successful but dishonest. They are manipulative, narcissistic and have superficial charm. Collins had a necrophiliac obsession too. He told a girl that if a man had to kill, he killed. If he decided it was right for him to do it, then he had to do it. The perfect crime, he told her, was when there was no guilt. Without guilt, a person could not get caught. He had said something similar in an English paper. If a person wants something, he alone is the deciding factor of whether or not to take it regardless of what society thinks may be right or wrong. If a person holds a gun on somebody it's up to him to decide whether to take the other's life or not. The point is, it's not society's judgment that's important, but the individual's own choice of will and intellect. Mary Therese Flesser was born December 4, 1947 in Willis, Michigan. Nineteen-year-old Mary began working as a secretary at Eastern Michigan University Field Service Office. Mary majored in accounting. From the friends and family who knew her, they said she was a lovely person and a devout Catholic. Mary would sing and play the organ at her church services regularly. Her close friends said she was essentially quiet and a private person, she was by no means a party girl who was reserved and naive about men. One friend said about Mary when asked if they knew of anyone who'd want to hurt her, she answered no one. Mary was a lovely person, sweet and good, one of life's innocents. On July 9, 1967, at 8.30 p.m. Mary went for a walk and vanished from the campus of Eastern Michigan University. Her family said her going missing was complete out of character but they didn't want to pry because she was an adult in college. Last seen being approached by a blue and gray Chevy on Ballard Street by her neighbor shaking her head no. It was clear that the driver was hairdressing Mary. The driver then sped around the block and tries to stop Mary by pulling aggressively into a driveway, forcing her to walk around. Mary shakes her head no once more and the car was seen driving off and Mary walking out of sight towards the direction of her apartment. Never to be seen alive again. Mary unclothed body was found on August 7, 1967 on the Scottney Brothers' deserted farm near Gettys and LaForge Road by two teenage boys. Mary was stabbed 30 to 40 times in the chest and abdomen. Twenty of which were from something sharp like a knife, the rest were irregular. They could have been from insects or feral animals. She had small teeth imprints on her flesh and exposed bones. Mary's feet have been severed above the ankle, the pathologist believes her bones were smashed as there was no evidence of sawing or cutting of the ankle bones. Her thumb and sections of her fingers were missing from one hand, and the forearm on the other side had been severed. She also had been slashed across her back. It is unclear if she had been sexually violated. Her face was unrecognizable and her remains were covered by the elements for two months only identifiable by her dental records. The investigators searched the abandoned farm and dug through piles of soggy cardboard and found clothing stacked beneath a packing crate. They found an orange dress with white polka dots that was torn down the middle. The zipper still zipped. Investigators also found a white bra with ripped shoulder straps, a pair of white underwear ripped at the seam and a piece of white cloth that suggested it was a pad. Part of another strap was found on the trail, about ten feet from the wet moldy clothing, covered in insects was a right tan sandal, size six and a half B. Mary was killed elsewhere and dumped. It was clear that the killer came back to the scene and moved the body. Several times. Days later, a young man showed up at the Moore funeral home that was holding Mary Flesser's body for her funeral service. The visitor asked for permission to take a photograph of the body, saying it was a keepsake for Flesser's parents. The employee on duty Harold Bitten told the visitor no and when asked why, Harold replied because that's a disgusting, creepy fucking request and the body was decomposed. The visitor replied you mean you can't fix her up enough so I could just get one picture of her? The man left without a word after being told no a second time. Harold described the visitor as a white male, 18 to 20 years old. 
5 feet 10 inches medium build and light complexion wearing a long sleeve shirt with no tie and black pants that weren't cuffed. He had white papers sticking out of his pocket. He had on loafer style shoes. Added that the visitor didn't have a camera with him but drove a silver blue gray car. According to MI State Police, the Flessers had no knowledge of him. The Ypsilanti police tracked down every blue slash gray car and everyone had an alibi. The police concluded that the murderer was just passing through. Almost a year later, Joan Elspeth Shell, born on December 1, 1947, in New Paris, Wisconsin. She was a 20 year old whose family moved to Plymouth, Michigan. She was an art major at Eastern Michigan University and lived on Emmett Street in Ypsilanti. I wasn't sure where to add this, but knowing that we know who the killer is, directly across the street from Joan at 619, Emmett Street lived John Normal Collins. Joan was last seen alive by her roommate Susan Colby on June 30, 1968 at a Washington Avenue bus stop in Ann Arbor when she missed the bus. She was trying to visit her boyfriend Dale Schult, who they were secretly engaged, when a red and black Pontiac Bonneville containing three young white men stopped. The drive had dark hair and parted to the side asked want a ride? Later on when asked an eyewitness believed the driver to be John Collins, remember he lived across the street from her. Susan tried to tell Joan it was a bad idea but Joan went anyway. Promising to call her and assure her on her safe journey, as it is only an 11-minute drive. Less than three hours later, Susan reported Joan is missing. July 6, 1968 Days after getting into the red car with three young men, about 20 miles away from where Mary's body was found, outside an arbor on a construction site with little to no effort to conceal the body with just clumps of grass. Joan was found with her blue miniskirt twisted around her neck, sexually violated and stabbed no less than 47 times with her throat slashed with a knife about 4 inches in length. Several wounds punctured her lungs, liver and carotid artery, with one addition infliction behind her left ear traveling upwards into her brain and fracturing her skull. And her spinal bone was cut at the back of the neck by so much force. From Mary's autopsy Dr. Hendricks noted that there would be four pints of blood missing from all the wounds. No pools of blood were found at the scene indicating she wasn't killed there but moved. He also noted that the body was incredibly clean considering, as if she were bathed prior to. Note, her body had been in the place where it was found less than 24 hours, part of the body was still fresh, as if it were preserved, while the upper part was black and leathery, as exposed to the elements. In addition to the outstanding similarities between the wounds inflicted upon Joan's body and those inflicted upon Mary's, the previous year led investigators to establish a definite connection between both murders, and four detectives were assigned to work full-time on both cases. Police sought out the registered owners of more than 150 red and black vehicles in the state of Michigan, and established the alibis of numerous men who matched the description of the driver Colby had provided. But all leads went cold. Collins was brought in for questioning. He denied knowing Joan even though he lived across the street from her and provided an alibi for the weekend of her disappearance saying he was at his mother's house in Centerline and had not returned to Ypsilanti until the morning of July 1st. Police took his word and never verified his alibi. He was a personable, clean-cut young man with the goal of becoming a teacher, so no one thought seriously that he might have had something to do with this brutal murder. He sent the detectives on their way with a friendly, sure hope you catch that guy. Dale Skultz became a suspect quick, he was AWOL from the military. He was released when he passed a polygraph test. Also was visibly distraught when he heard about Joan's murder. Note we now have two jurisdiction, Mary found in Ann Arbor and Joan found in Ypsilanti. We have two separate detectives, with no connection yet. Our reward totally $7,800 which is about $66,383 in today's money for information leading to the conviction of both homicides. Eight months later, Jane Louise Mixer, born February 23, 1946, was a 23-year-old from Muskegon, Michigan, a high school valedictorian. She was a freshman law student at University of Michigan committed to changing the world. She was one of the 37 women in her class out of 420. People who knew her said she was trusting and compassionate. Her niece Maggie said Jane was many things I wanted to be driven, disobedient, brilliant, independent. She also read a page from Jane's journal from 1966 you know for a world that demands direction. I certainly have none. Will I be a teacher? Will I go to France? 
really I don't know how smart I am. And that above all else keeps me working and working hard. Phil Weitzman, Jane's fiancé, said whatever she got involved in, she was extremely passionate about. On March 20, 1968, Jane was trying to get to her hometown, Muskegon, to visit her family. She was eager to inform them of the news about her engagement and plans to move to New York after school. She posted a note on a college bulletin board, according to Phil the note Red Ride wanted to Muskegon, Thursday. Call Janey, with her phone number and address. Back then you didn't think twice about putting your address on a bulletin board. People were more trusting and less fearful. Jane told her parents she would be leaving in Arbor around 6 p.m. and expected to arrive at 9.30 p.m. A person giving the name David Johnson responded very quickly to her note and said he'd be leaving for Muskegon at about 6.30 p.m. Jane agreed to meet him at the Law Quad. At around 7 p.m. Phil, Jane's fiancé called her to see if she had left, Jane said she was still waiting at her room. An hour later he tried again with no answer. Around 11 p.m. Jane's dad began to look for her down I-94 with growing concern. Later that night, early morning Jane was murdered. On March 21, 1969 a 13-year-old boy was walking to his school bus stop when he noticed a shopping bag set, the boy looked inside to find a blue-wrapped present, college notebooks, typed reports and a birthday card. He brought it home to his mother thinking they were important, his mother insisted they return it where he found it near the Indenton Cemetery. The mother sent him off to school as she went to return these things, back upon looking at the bag she spotted a dark, gooey substance, it was blood. Arriving at the cemetery she discovered a top of a grave. A fully clothed girl, covered with her own yellow raincoat and a copy of the novel Catch-22 by Joseph Heller placed by her side. Jane was shot twice in the head with a .22 caliber pistol and strangled with nylon stocking that did not belong to her. She was not sexually violated. It is assumed that that was the motive but when the killer pulled down her tights and exposed a menstrual pad, the assault stopped and she was killed around 1 a.m. on March 21st. Police investigated the fiancé Phil, who didn't know she was dead only missing at the time. When they informed him of the horrid news he was visibly shaken and disturbed over her murder. He was released. The police checked all David Johnson's in Washtenaw County, every small caliber gun the police came across went to ballistics, they were test-fired and compared with the recovered bullet fragments. The gun the killer used was never found. Jane was killed elsewhere and placed on the grave. There was a lot of speculation that she was not connected to the other victim because the location was far from the others, here's a map. Insert map and because she was fully clothed and Jane had not been beaten, stabbed or mutilated. The garment around her neck and the proximity of her abduction led investigators to link Jane Mixer's murder to Mary Flesser and Joan Shells. Five days later, another construction worker found their worst nightmare. Marlon Skelton, born March 4, 1953, in Romulus, Michigan, was only 16 years old. Sadly Marlon ran with a bad crowd of known users and sellers. She was engaged to Michael Millich who purposed her on her 16th birthday. One friend, who had been good friends with Marlon, described her as an A.B. student, a musician who played the clarinet in the school band and was active in school. There wasn't anything that Marlon couldn't do. But last summer she started to fade away and became involved in smoking marijuana, and she became a speed freak. Another friend said that Marlon took karate lessons with Sharon. Sharon said Marlon was a third-degree red belt karate expert, and she was pretty good. Mike charged her with a knife once as a test, and she threw him on the ground almost breaking his wrist. I imagine whoever attacked her was pretty big or had a weapon of some kind, upon googling because I know nothing about karate. But in karate, the red belt is reserved for exemplary masters of the art and is above the black belt. Keep that in your head for later. On March 23, 1969 around 3 p.m. Marlin phoned her friend Sharon from a payphone that her father just dropped her off at a gas station at the corner of Carpenter Road and Washtenaw Avenue. Marlin asked if she could get a ride but Sharon had no transportation but said she'd meet her at McKinney Student Union. Marlin said she'd hitchhike the three miles to Ypsilanti. Which back then hitchhiking was normal, a lot of people did it and didn't think twice about the dangers. That night was Marlin was never heard from or seen alive again. Sharon tried to put a missing person report in but the police refused since it was out of their jurisdiction. 
The MI State Police refused to take a formal missing person report because it didn't come from a relative or a parent. Sharon tried twice to file a missing report for her friend only to be turned down. The next day Sharon and Michael, the fiancé went to the MI State Police only to leave angry and convinced nothing would happen. At this point Marilyn had been missing well over 24 hours. On March 24, Marilyn's mother downplayed her daughter's disappearance because Marilyn has run away numerous times but had always returned. She also told the state police she didn't understand why Michael was trying to get a missing person report because Marilyn had a problem with narcotics and was traveling to Ypsilanti because she owned some hippies some money. Mrs. Skelton half-heartedly phoned Wayne County Police and finally put in a missing person report on Marilyn, sadly it was too late. Marilyn's body was found on March 25 around 11 a.m. near Glacier Way and Earhart. She was just a few hundred yards from where the body of Joan Shell's discovery site was only eight months prior. Marilyn's new body was found behind a vacant house on a remote, rural section of Earhart Road. Crime scene noted that there was a dramatic increase of the injuries. One investigator described the injuries inflicted upon Jane was the worst he had seen in 30 years of police work. Marilyn was thoroughly bludgeoned to death. Her right eye socket was crushed. Her skull was cracked in three places and her face had massive bruising and lacerations. A piece of blue cloth was shoved in her mouth, partially covering her face. She had a garter belt wrapped around her neck. Imprinted across her breasts were marks that could have been from restraints to hold the victim, remember she was a third-degree red belt, she had restraints to hold her as he whipped her torso and upper legs with a leather belt. An eleven-and-a-half branch was savagely rammed into her vagina leaving seven inches protruding and evidence reported that she had been beaten with no mercy with a belt before she died. Next to her were her clothes, a white bra was found over her head with one of the straps. A blue windbreaker was lying under her but and a few feet away were a pair of brown loafers, a torn pair of light blue underwear, a used tampon, a pair of jeans and a torn portion of a blue t-shirt. Her screams were muffled with a piece of her own blue clothing. Evidence shows that she may have attempted to escape, there were blood spatterings and churned soil close to the crime scene which indicated that she had been beaten close to where her body was discovered. Her ears were pierced but only the right had an earring. Along with the missing earring was a brown leather pouch style purse with brass eyelets and a long drawstring, a black wallet with her ID and approximate $30 should have been in the purse. Marilyn was also wearing a diamond engagement ring Michael gave to her on her 16th birthday, none of which were found with the body. Since Marilyn was a known drug user, dealer and occasional police informant, some investigators believed her murder may have been drug-related. Her father Archie Skelton was a suspect at first, he was known to discipline her using a paddle. After a polygraph test, although proven to be a liar and a bully, he was innocent in his daughter's murder. His alibi checked out. An Arbor police chief linked Skelton's murder to the series nonetheless. Police were stunned as there was no trace evidence of any DNA, no semen of the killer. Only that of Marilyn's, which notes she was not on any drugs at the time of death. In 2009, Michigan State Police took new evidence, they took photographs of the contents of her purse. Items included things like lipstick, keys, sunglasses, and a change purse. Insert photo. Along with Skelton's personal items was a small photo album. The collection of photos had messages from friends written on the back. Top, Marilyn, to a real cool girl with a swinging personality. Good luck with the guys. ABC Frank. Bottom, eternity. Hours fly. Flowers die. New days. New ways. Pass by. Love stays. Marlon, sick, to a girl who was both sweet and had a great personality. Good luck in the future. Terry, 70. We're now in five separate jurisdictions where the murderer had abducted or disposed of the bodies of the victims. Investigators exchanged information on an irregular basis. No coordination to combine efforts and resources were until the third victim's was definitely linked to the series. By April, each law enforcement agency's collectively assigned 20 investigators to exclusively work upon the four homicides. Other than eyewitness descriptions and forensic reports there was little physical evidence. What police had in common with the victims were. All of the victims had been brunette white girls. Each, excluding Mixer, 
had been beaten with a blunt and or plated object prior to their murder. Each victim was found within a 15-mile radius of Washtenaw County. Each victim, excluding Mixer, had knife wounds to the neck. Each victim had an article of clothing tied around their neck. Each woman had been menstruating at the time of her death. And these factors led investigators that at least three out of the four murders were from the same person. Three weeks after Marlin. Don Luis Basom, born on November 28, 1955 in Ypsilanti, Michigan. She was only 13, in the eighth grade and the youngest of the victims. Dawn was athletic and energic, described as a tomboy. She loved to wrestle with her older brother, which possibly led to her putting up a struggle and resisted being captured, which led to her awful, horrendous, torture that led to her murder. Dawn got along with her family and had no trouble making or keeping friends. From one of Dawn's school classmates Dawn had many friends and was popular at school. She had a unique bedroom decorated unlike any I had ever seen. There was huge decals of guitars and record album covers stapled everywhere. She had a large poster of a guy who resembled Elvis. Dawn's mom let kids come over to their house to listen to music. Dawn had lots of slumber parties. Dawn loved to dance, and Mrs. Basom let us have chaperoned mixed parties of boys and girls. Dawn was a sweet, 13-year-old girl who looked older than she was. Dawn had a high IQ of 133 but her grades were only slightly above average. Gerald Shielk, her homeroom teacher said Dawn was a wholesome girl who associated with a nice group of kids. Her principal at West Junior High, Harold Goodsman described her as an average to good student with a happy disposition. On April 15, 1969 Dawn was given a ride by her brother-in-law at the corner of East Cross and River ST in Depot Town to meet up with 17-year-old Earl Kidd. Dawn was wearing a white plastic jacket, a white cotton blouse, an orange wool sweater and some blue nylon stretch pants. Dawn was leaving her friend's house near Eastern Michigan University with Earl, promising her mom that she'd be home before dark. At around 7.25 p.m. Earl and Dawn were about to part ways when he asked of her if he wanted him to walk her home, Dawn declined knowing her mother wouldn't approve of his age and it was barely a mile away from her home. On her walk Dawn saw two of her friends fishing on a small footbridge over the Huron River. After talking for about five minutes she asked if they would walk her home as it was getting dark. The boys declined. Dawn was seen walking along alongside the Penn Central Railroad tracks. It was a short cut to get to her home on LaForge Road. A 31-year-old train bluff seen her around 7.35 walking alongside the tracks then the train pulled out on schedule. That was the last time she was ever seen alive. Dawn's body was found the next day less than 150 yards from her front porch, near Gale and Freeland Road in Superior Township. She was half-naked wearing only a white blouse and bra, which was pushed up around her neck. Dawn was strangled with 40 inches of electrical wire that was left knotted around her neck. She was stabbed repeatedly in the chest and genitals, slashed across her breasts, buttocks, and stomach. A ripped-off piece of her blouse was found stuffed down her throat. Investigators found no definite evidence of being sexually violated but showed possible presence of semen from a vagina swab. Glass particles found on the bottom of Dawn's shoes were similar to those found in the basement of an abandoned farmhouse. About one-third of a mile from where Mary Flesser's body was found almost two years earlier. Sheriff Harvey and his deputies were searching the farmhouse, there they found Dawn's orange sweater along with further pieces of her clothing, a coil of electrical wire, the same used to strangle her, also in the farmhouse was fresh blood. For the first time in four murders, police had discovered their first murder site. Forensic investigators only found partial finger and palm prints which were unable to match to Dawn's. Meaning it was the killers but the police still didn't have any leads. Other items found at the abandoned farmhouse were two large boards with footprints on them, a piece of white cloth and a pair of size 42 blue underwear, not Dawn's. They also found various fabric fibers, one gray button, four white buttons and numerous pieces of broken glass with blood spots on them. Near the back of the house was eight two-ply tissues containing a crusty, yellowish-white substance which later tested to be semen and what appeared to be a pubic hair that was not Dawn's. Note, the doctors were certain she was not on her period. Three weeks later on May 6, officers returned to search the empty farmhouse for the second time. This is where they discovered scraps of Dawn's blouse and a pearl earring that was deliberately placed. The killer began to taunt the police. 
On May 13, 1969 only 100 feet from the abandoned farmhouse where Dawn's murder took place, a barn was set on fire at 3.17 a.m. Superior Township Fire Department allowed the fully engulfed barn to burn to the ground but prevented the farmhouse and cellar from catching fire, only receiving water damage. Ypsilanti press reporter John Cobb found laying there, perfectly in an even row on the driveway to the farmhouse. Five clipped purple lilac blossoms. Investigators theorized the murderer placed them there to symbolize each victim. On May 15, Michigan State Police arrested Ralph R. Crass. A 21-year-old student at Eastern Michigan University at his apartment in Harper Woods, Michigan, which was on the same street as Don Basom House on LaForge Road. Unable to post his bail at $5,000, he was sent to the county jail. Police say Crass admitted along with his roommate Clyde Searle and one other companion, name unknown, and set dry hay on fire in the barn loft with no reasoning as to why except that they were drinking. They were charged with arson but cleared of any involvement with Don's murder. Question the lilacs and the other evidence? This is heartbreaking but upon researching, six of Dawn's classmates bore her white coffin to her grave. Less than two months after Dawn's murder. Alice Elizabeth Callum, born on December 25, 1947, in Middlebury, Indiana. Alice was a 21-year-old student who lived in Kalamazoo, Michigan who took a course at University of Michigan in design. She graduated May 3 with a degree in fine arts with a B average. A neighbor remembers Alice as a friendly, wholesome-looking girl with a vivid imagination. The apartment she lived at, the manager's son said she was a quiet girl who was interested in photography. The only complaint he could remember was that she used quite a bit of water when developing pictures for her film class. Her father spoke of his daughter as a fine, nice girl. Others said she was a quiet, studious, book reader who didn't seem to date much. She was quite a real likable person. A high school teacher said Alice exercised very quiet leadership. She was a very conscientious student, a very serious one. Her high school principal described her as warm and friendly but at times reserved. Alice was last seen walking home towards her apartment on Thompson ST after a part at the depot house in an arbor where she was seen dancing with a young man with long hair. She was carrying her new purple dress shoes because she didn't want to get them wet, wearing her loafers. She also had on multicolored horizontal stripped rain coat. Alice's body was found near an abandoned barn near North Territorial Road and US 23. She was partially undressed. She was wearing a purple blouse that was torn open and small pieces were cut out of it, and a pearl tight button was missing. She had been wearing large, dangling earrings that were three and a half inches long. One still in her ear, the other one under her head. Her black bra was cut in front and dangling loose on either side. Her black slip had been cut at the waistband. Her white miniskirt was found next to her with a boot print and blood on it. Her pantyhose were cut in the thigh and crotch area. A pair of mini brief underwear was cut up into separate pieces and stuck between two toes on her right foot, and her purple shoes were missing. Alice was reported to have been sexually violated, repeatedly skewered, her throat slashed and a bullet fired into her brain. It was apparent that the bullet passed through her thumb first. Alice was killed elsewhere and dumped with her clothing scattered around her body. A devastating quote from her father after he identified his daughter to the reporters, lashing out at the University of Michigan. I don't want her body. I want her alive. I didn't come here for her body. I'm not going to claim her body. I'm going to tell them, the public, not to go to this university. It's too big. They don't give a damn about anything but money and politics. I'm not going to bury her. Let them bury her on the president's lawn. I've worked too damn hard to raise her, to send her here. I don't want her dead. The next day she was laid to rest at Mount Everest Memorial Park in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Note the bullet resembled the same rifling specifics as the bullet removed from the head of earlier victim Jane Mixer. Thought to be the third victim of this serial killer. It was impossible to get an opinion whether the same weapon fired both bullets due to the extreme damage to the mixer bullet. Police tried to catch the killer for two years. A task force was formed. Dan Meyer from Michigan State Police Chief of Detectives was in charge. He had 50 detectives from five areas of police agencies. Michigan State Police, 
Washtenaw County Sheriff Department, Ann Arbor Police Ypsilanti Police and Michigan University Campus Police. By July 1969, over 1,000 sex offenders had been questioned and authorities checked out over 800 tips, they offered more than $40,000, $340,547 in today, and reward money for the information on the murderer. In desperation, they even consulted an internationally renowned psychic, Peter Herkos, who claims he got his psychic powers after falling off a ladder in 1941. Kirkos fell four stories, spent three days in a coma and claims he woke up with ESP extrasensory perception and claims his accuracy of 85%. In 1964 Kirkos interjected himself in the Boston Strangler case. He was not asked to help, he harassed an innocent man who had to be institutionalized after. Kirkos pretended to be a police investigator, he was arrested and would be charged if he didn't leave town. He proclaimed that Albert DeSalvo was innocent if you don't know he murdered 13 women in Boston, Massachusetts, Albert DeSalvo confessed to being the Boston Strangler. On July 21, 1969 Herkos lands at Detroit Metro Airport, getting off the plane he said the killer knows I come for him. And I get him maybe he comes after me so Herkos is not afraid. I wasn't going to add this but Herkos was on crutches because he recently injured his leg. Once he was in the hotel room only visible to Archie Allen, the one who helped bring him here, and Ed Silver, Herco's assistant, Herco's threw down his crutches and walked around his suite normally. If that doesn't tell you what type of person he is, I don't know what will. Herco's proclaimed that the murderer had blonde hair and other times said it was brown. Described him as 5 feet 5 inches or 5 feet 6 inches weighing 140 pounds. Side note Collins was 6 foot and 180 pounds, Herco's also said the killer drove a motorbike and went to school at night. He was also associated in some way with a trailer. Kirkos was coming up empty. He wanted to handle evidence which he cannot. Kirkos was just seeming to waste police's time and money. A lot of sources said the exact same thing of Peter Hurok's prediction in the investigation. He predicted that the murderer was a strongly built white male under 25 years of age, he was born outside the United States, and he rode a motorcycle. He revealed details of the murders to police that had not been previously released. He also predicted that the killer would strike one more time and soon. I could not find the information Herox revealed that the police didn't. Take what you want with a psychic with a grain of salt. On July 23, 1969 the campus police at Eastern Michigan University received a missing persons report from Sherry Green. She reported roommate Karen Sue Bainman, an 18-years-old student, had failed to appear at dinner or her room after curfew. Ypsilanti police reacted immediately and learned that Karen was due to pick up a wig from a downtown wig store, where she was last seen heading. Karen Sue Bainman was born on February 10, 1951 Grand Rapids, Michigan. Karen was a lively and vivacious 18-year-old graduate of Christian High School in Grand Rapids, Michigan. She was freshman at Eastern Michigan University, eager to start her career in special education. She wanted to make a difference in handicapped children. A high school friend Becky said Karen was a shroud-thinking and a sensible girl, but she was gullible and trusted people. On July 22, 1969 Karen writes a letter home, Don't worry. I'm careful assuring her parents she was aware of the danger and included an article on the murders warning coeds to be cautious. On July 23, 1969 Karen was eating lunch with her roommate Sherry and asked her if she wanted to go to the wig shop with her. Sherry said no, she needed to study. Another roommate of Karen's, Kay and Knowles, last saw Karen leaving lunch and walking towards the wig shop. That afternoon Karen was leaving wigs by Joan, picking up her hairpiece and talking to the manager and said she did two foolish things today. Buying a hairpiece and accepting a ride from a stranger. The employees tried to tell Karen not to get back on the bike with the man as she fit the victim profile, petite, brunette and had pierced ears. They said it looked as if she was telling the man no but he must have persuaded her to get on and drove off for the last time to be seen alive. Karen didn't show up for dinner nor till curfew at 11 p.m. At 11.15 p.m. Karen was reported missing by Sherry to EMU Campus Police to Ypsilanti Police. The employees at Wigs by Joan described Karen wearing a blue and white stripped sleeveless top and some cut-off blue jeans and leather sandals. They remembered her so well because while well, obviously the stranger and the motorcycle. They described a young guy on a flashy blue motorcycle, 
wearing a green and yellow striped short sleeve t-shirt, appeared to be in his early twenties, nice build about six feet tall clean cut with short brown hair. The one employee thought the motorcycle was a Honda 450 with a square mirror on the handlebar. Finally something the police can go off, a description of the suspect and a vehicle. Police went searching for this Honda 450 only to find out that wasn't even the make or model of the bike Karen was last seen on. The police went back to the wig shop and next to wigs by Joan was the chocolate shop where an employee there knew a lot about bikes, she said that the motorcycle was blue British Bill Triumph with lots of chrome. A composite sketch was made and printed in the paper. Insert pick. Someone thought it looked like John Norman Collins, the one who got kicked out of Theta Chi, another woman said he stopped her and offered her a ride on his motorcycle and described it as a blue with lots of chrome. She said the guy was wearing a green strip shirt with cut-off shorts and had dark brown hair but was much straighter than the composite sketch. No accent was pleasant and was very good looking. When the police showed her a photo she verified that that was the guy who stopped her. It was John Norman Collins. Note the police showed the women from the wig shop a picture of John and neither could confirm that that was the man on the bike from the greeny photo. On July 26, Ah Waka Dr and his wife found Karen's body in a wooded gully which is a ravine formed by the action of water, off Riverside Drive and Chalmers near the Huron River Inn in Arbor Township. It had looked as if the body was pushed down the embankment. Karen's face was badly beaten, she was strangled, her, her upper body from her neck, shoulders, breasts and stomach scalded with some sort of liquid, which she was forced to ingest and was muffled with a section of cloth. She had some lacerations inflicted being so sever, sections of skin had been removed. Karen received extensive skull and brain injuries that came from a blunt object. That object was never found. Karen's torn underwear was wadded up and stuffed into her vagina and the cops found the garment to be covered with 509 short, mostly blonde hair clippings. They measured less than three-eighths of an inch and did not belong to the victim who had dark brown hair. Along with the presence of human semen, she had been raped either while she was dying or right afterward. There was a definite pattern to the killer's choice in victim, usually walking alone, they accept a ride and disappears. All girls were white brunette and murdered in rainy weather. Keeping in mind that the killer eventually would return to the scene of the prior murders and move the bodies. Maybe it was for sexual pleasure. E.W. Police assumed the killer would return to Karen's body. Since the body was sheltered in a wooded gully, this time Sheriff Harvey was successful in keeping the discovery out of the news. He tried twice before but the news was ahead of him. He ordered a stakeout, a prosecutor said he had to replace the body with a mannequin they got one from J.C. Penny backslash from Arbolin Mall. That night it rained a heavy, humid storm diminishing visibility, swarming with mosquitoes and at 12.15 the following morning when a deputy spotted a jogger stopped by the mannequin, he tried to radio a description to the others, but his walkie-talkie failed due to the rain making it inoperable. The sound of a car engine told them that whoever that was, he got away. Public outcry when they heard that the police let the killer get away. One student said we're not talking about the creature from the Black Lagoon. We're talking about a smooth guy or guys who can pick up girls, take them somewhere and kill them. On July 27, 1969 the chief assistant prosecutor insisted that John Norman Collins be put under 24-hour surveillance but not to be picked up until they learned more or he was caught in a crime. Police tried to stake out his house but his roommate caught them and told them that John was at his mother's house in Centerline. With that information Centerline Police was asked to survey his mom's house where they found John deep cleaning a silver Oldsmobile cutlass inside and out. The trunk included. Collins was now a person on interest. The police arrested him due to him being a flight risk. But were not informed of the no pickup yet. Two hours of interrogations and John agreed to take a polygraph test in the morning. Collins got a lawyer, Robert Francis who advised Collins not to take the test and told the police to either charge his client or let him go. He was released. That's when the governor of Michigan, William Milliken, asked the FBI for assistance. Even though seven women had been murdered, the FBI had no jurisdiction since no federal laws were broken. Milliken ordered the Michigan State Police to take over, one in particular State Police Corporal David Leake will play an important role on the arrest of John Norman Collins. Getting California involved, in June of 1969 Collins traveled with his escapade buddy Andrew Manuel to California. 
Collins was driving his mother's new 1968 silver Oldsmobile Cutlass pulling a 17-foot rented house trailer that was paid for with a stolen check and the ID that was provided was stolen as well. Roxy and Phillips was born on March 21, 1952 in New Mexico but moved to Milwaukee, Oregon. Roxy was a 17-year-old who played the violin and sang in the church choir. She was active in high school, was popular and a good student. Roxy lived in Milwaukee with her mother. She was more than ecstatic when given the chance to babysit for the Kunai's family and visit her friends in Salina, California. On June 30, Roxy was going to mail a letter and visit a friend, Nancy Albrecht. Roxy told Mrs. Kunai's that she returned by 4 p.m. to watch the children. Roxy got as far as mailing the letter. By 7 p.m. she was reported missing. Roxy was last seen wearing a short red pant dress with small white floral design with a matching fabric belt, full sleeves with white cuffs, a white collar, with white sandals, and carrying a large straw tote bag. She never made it to visit Nancy. That evening an eyewitness saw Roxy get into a silver-gray Oldsmobile Cutlass with Michigan plates, speeding away running a red light and making a hard right. When interviewing Nancy on July 18th she said she last saw Roxy at the Kanai's home on June 29th, the day before she disappeared. Nancy said as she walked home a white male, in his early twenties with short brown hair wearing Levite jeans and a t-shirt pulled up in a flashy silver car with Michigan plates. He said his name was John and he was studying to be an elementary teacher and that him and a friend pulled a trailer all the way from Michigan. John then asked Nancy on a date for the next. When John dropped her off at home, Nancy called Roxy to tell her about the guy she just met. The next day John and Roxy went missing. Nancy never got her date. Roxy's body was found on July 13, 1969, by two boys who were looking for fossils in Pescadores Canyon just north of Carmel, California. Roxy's nude body was badly decomposed only wearing her sandals. She had been strangled with her own red and white belt that was still wrapped tightly around her neck. One of her earrings were missing. Her body had to have been carried where it was found and placed in a patch of poison oak. One of the investigators came in contact with a bad case of poison oak, he assumed the killer did also. It was a long shot but he asked around hospitals if anyone had been treated recently for a case of poison oak with John's description. They were in luck, Mr. Collins was treated for poison oak. Not sure where to add this but Eileen Adams, only 13 from Toledo, Ohio was thought to be a Collins' ninth victim but was cleared in her story, is awful and deserve a whole video on its own. The home of me State Police Corporal David Leak, remember we mentioned him earlier, returned home from a family trip. Before leaving for vacation David's wife, sister of Loretta, John Collins' mother, gave the kids a haircut. Quickly swept up the hair clippings and threw them away. They had left their nephew watch their dog, but was only to be in the basement. Although he had a key to the house but wasn't to go in. That nephew was John Norman Collins. When they returned home David discovered black paint splashed across his basement floor and noticed that a can of spray paint that he had left in the basement was gone. His wife said that a box of detergent and bottle of ammonia were also missing. When questioned by Leek and his wife, John Collins denies it all. Later that evening Leek and another police office scrapped the black paint and assumed the brown sticky substance to be blood. Side note it was a final finish. On July 31, 1969 the crime lab started to search for evidence at the leak home. When searching for evidence, they found several blood spots on a shirt, friction marks on the copper pipe above and at the bottom of the floor joist which showed someone possibly being tied up. A lab expert noticed hundreds of hair clippings near Slash under the washer, he gathered some from the basement and compared it to the ones already at the lab. Cord marks on the victim's wrists matched an electrical cord found in the leak basement. The hairs found in the basement were found to be that of the same that were stuffed into Karen Bainman's vagina. John Collins was picked up on July 31, 1969 by his uncle David Leak and two other officers. Police wanted to fingerprint him and take his picture but his attorney said no, they only could question him since he hasn't been booked. While waiting for physical evidence, they were searching the impounded silver Oldsmobile Collins drove to California. John and his attorney were about to leave when the police got the arrest warrant and arrested Collins right there. Michigan State Police shared their information about evidence that they found in John's vehicle after he was arrested for Karen Bainman's murder. They found blood on the front seat and seatbelt. The seat was removed and taken in for examination. 
the blood was determined to be human type O. This was before DNA positive identification. Under the seat was found a small piece of red fabric the size of a dime. Selena's police gave a sample from the fabric found in John's car to a scientist and he was able to compare it to the belt that was removed from Roxy's throat. Both samples were to be from the same cotton, they were woven the same way and had the same dye and the white floral pattern was the same size. Colin's car linked Roxy to him with physical evidence with the fabric. They had also found 22 pubic hairs on a brown sweater taken from Colin's closet. They didn't match any of the other victims. By now Roxy was buried and had to be exhumed to get pubic hair samples, fingerprints, and blood evidence. Found by microscopic examination the hairs found on Colin's sweater to be similar in every way to the ones from Roxy's body. Colin's case was the most expensive and longest criminal trial in Washtenaw County history. At the time, on August 1, 1969 Collins was formally arraigned for the murder or Karen Sue Bainman held without bond. Witness selection took nearly two weeks, the prosecutor William F. Delhaye focused only on the murder or Karen Sue Bainman. On August 12, 1969 Richard Ryan was appointed to represent John Collins. August 14 was Collins' first pretrial after hearing nine prosecution witnesses in six hours, Collins was formally ordered to stand trial. In September at the second hearing, after six witness testimonies, which Ryan tried to get dismissed due to lack of evidence waiting for an impartial jury to decide if the lack of evidence claim should be thrown out. On October 14, the judge threw out the claims and Collins had in trial dates set for June 1, 1970 for first-degree murder and the wrongful death of Karen Sue Bainman. Richard Ryan had doubts on Collins and asked for an off-the-record polygraph test. Collins accepted and they went across the street to the courthouse from the jail. On that walk he was visibly shaken, crying and nervous. Ryan would like to talk to Collins in private before the polygraph. After about an hour, he said take him back to jail, the polygraph test is cancelled and suggested a change in defense tantamount to a diminished capacity plea. I had no idea what that meant but basically even though they broke the law they should not be held fully criminally liable for doing so as their mental functions were diminished or impaired aka insanity defense. Collins' mother was outraged and fired him immediately. Replaced with a more expensive duo Neil Fink and Joseph Lewisell. Partners at one of Detroit's highest-priced law firms in January 1970. On June 2, 1977 the trial began and they needed to find a jury. With all the media, it was hard to find people to be on the jury. Jury selection took five long weeks and examined 294 people on July 9th, the judge finally had a jury seven men and seven women, and trial was set for August 14, 1970. One year and 22 days after the disappearance of Karen Sue B. and Men, Michigan's most public and expensive case went to the people of Michigan. Public health employee Curtis Fluker had matched the type A blood found in the leak's basement to the same type blood taken from the victim, although he had failed to do more sophisticated tests for subtyping. Walter Holtz, a chemist, testified that the hairs found in Karen's underwear were identical to those found on the floor of the leak's basement. Let me tell you reading about the trial was an interesting and long one. They had 47 witnesses to appear for the prosecution at the trial. Five defense witnesses for Colin. Colin's lawyers were something else. If you want me to go further into detail I can make a separate video. Let me know in the comments. On August 13, 1970 both prosecution and defense attorneys to leave their closing arguments to the jury. Collins' lawyers Neil Fink and Joseph Lewisell had their own closing arguments, describing Collins as young victim of circumstances and the evidence presented as fuzzy allegations. August 14, Judge Conlon told the jury they only had two choices for the verdict, guilty of first-degree murder or not guilty. The death sentence was not an option as Michigan had abolished the death penalty for murder in 1846, the first state to abolish the death penalty. But not constitutionally, it was constitutionally banned in 1963. Remember this was the 1970s and this was about to be the longest seated jury in Washtenaw County judicial history. On August 19, 1970, after deliberating for 27 hours over three days, an additional five and a half hours to re-listing to portions of testimonials, the jury brought in a unanimous verdict of guilty of first-degree murder of Karen Sue Bainman. Collins didn't speak at his trial nor did he show any emotions when the verdict was read. His mother who attended every single day and his sister cried as they left the courtroom. 
On August 28, Collins was formally sentenced to life imprisonment with no possibility of parole, with hard labor and solitary confinement at Jackson State Prison. At sentencing, Collins decided to speak. It was his first public comment since his arrest. In a dramatic last-ditch appeal to the public, the former EMU student stood up in court and calmly addressed Judge John Conlon. Your Honor, I have two things to say. I think they, the jury, conscientiously tried to give me a fair trial. The jury did not take its task lightly, but I think things were blown out of proportion. The circumstances surrounding this case prevented me from giving a fair trial. It was a travesty of justice that took place in this courtroom. I hope someday it will be corrected. Second, I never knew Taryn Sue Bainman. I never had a conversation with her. I never took her to a wig shop. I never took her to my uncle's home. I never took her life. Later, Collins was adamant about not killing Dawn Basom, since she was a baby. Collins tried to appeal his verdict. Once on December 14, 1970, it was denied on October 24, 1972, and between 1972 and 1976, Collins appealed his conviction four more times. All denied. Going back to California. On October 8, 1970, the Monterey County Prosecutor's Office signed by Governor Ronald Reagan Air Mail to Governor William Milliken a request to formally extradite Collins to answer to a grand jury for the murder and wrongful death of Roxy Ann Phillips. Governor Milliken was going to extradite Collins with the condition that California pays the cost and after his trial to be returned to Michigan to finish out his life sentence. Although Collins didn't get parole, he could be pardoned by a future governor after 20 years. Case law in California said that if a convict was extradited, it was a considered an act of clemency, basically meaning it's possible the state of Michigan could never see John Collins again. And if found not guilty in California, he would be a free man. January 20, 1971, Collins' lawyer Fink asked for an extradition hearing, which was held in Jackson State Prison closed to the public and press. The hearing began and lasted 10 minutes in February. Fink insisted that Collins was being denied due process. It was denied and the hearing was closed. March 5, 1971 Federal judge denied Collins' claims. Four months later California basically said they have too many murderers to try and catch. June 10th Governor Reagan said the extradition should be halted. With two appeals it would be inappropriate to remove Collins from Michigan. January 4th 1972 Lansing said the California request to extradite of John Collins for the murder of Roxy and Phillips is closed and will not be reopened. John was never convicted of any of the other girls. Collins was moved from Jackson State Prison to Marquette Branch Prison in October 1977 due to his repeated dealings in contraband and conspiring with an inmate to escape. The escape attempt was successful but without Collins, he had a broken foot. In January 1979 in Marquette he planned another escape with six other inmates via tunnel which failed they were transferred to a more secure cell block. I also read that the six inmates were transferred to different prison and Collins was the only was to stay at Marquette. In 1980 John legally changed his last to that of his father's, Chapman. Some sources who knew Collins said it was his desire to be associated with Mark David Chapman. In 1981, Collins requested a transfer to a Canadian prison, with the belief he would be released eventually. This is because Collins holds dual citizenship and under the Canadian law, at the time he would have been eligible for release after serving nine years. He was initially approved but it was revoked due to public outrage, he tried to appeal the reversal but lost. Andrew Manuel was formally charged for stealing the trailer and his bond was set at $7,500 upon searching him, a diamond ring valued at $500 was found in his pocket and it turned out to be a stolen ring from her apartment that was broken into, another $7,500 bond was set. In August 1990 Collins was transferred to the Ionia Correctional Facility but was later returned to Marquette Prison where he remains to this day. On November 25, 2004, more than 35 years after these murders, a new development was announced in the Ann Arbor News and the Associated Press. The lab found DNA on Jane's pantyhose, now in 2004 we have a match. He was a retired registered nurse, a husband of 28 years and a father of two grown children. Gary Earl Lederman, 62, from Goebbels, Michigan was charged with one count of murder in the death of Jane Louise. Mixer, a 23-year-old University of Michigan law student on July 11, 2005. Under Michigan law, his sentence is mandatory life in prison with no possibility of parole. 
he passed away at the age of 76 on July 4, 2019. The murders of the other six girls remain officially unsolved. In a 2019 interview Collins continues to deny his guilt, I felt somewhat obliged to at least give you a brief response since you have been kind of a pain in the ASS with your persistence. LOL. Don's house is now a collage rental. John's home is now a sorority full of girls. Joan House and Mary's apartment are still there. And the house where Karen was tortured and murdered is still there. Motive. Dated a lot of females, oversexed in 1967. Prone to rage and to bondage. Repulsed by women during their menstrual cycle. Did he murder them because they were on their period when he tried to assault them?